Good evening. Much has happened in the last several days, including the death of an EDSA hero. But one of the most shocking and one of the more consequential events was the belated news about the state of education in the Philippines. The 2022 update on the World Bank report on learning poverty carried a staggering statistic. The Philippines is learning poor with a rate of 90%. We need to understand what this really means in all its messy detail, but we can already point to one of its consequences. The quality of discourse in the public square can only suffer if the citizens that our educational system produces do not, in fact, know how to read. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. As it happens, the news about the dismal, abysmal state of our education is not, in fact, new. What the World Bank report did was to popularize a new concept, that of learning poverty. And what that new concept made possible was to force many of us to look anew, to look closer at our problems in education. We asked two resource persons who have been tracking these problems for many years to join us tonight to help us understand the scope, the scale, the depth and breadth of this crisis in education. Dr. Ed Fermin is Vice President for Academic Affairs at the National Teachers College. His PhD is in Filipino Language Planning and Policy from the University of the Philippines. Also with us, joining us all the way from France, is Ms. Lovelaine Basiliote, Executive Director of Philippine Business for Education and Chief of Party of Youth Works PH. Good evening, Dr. Fermin and Ms. Basiliote. Thank you for joining us today in the public square. Hello, Thank John. you so much, John. Oops. Let me start uh, with a question for Doc Ed. Uh, let's start by defining the terms. Uh, Doc Ed, what does the World Bank mean by learning poverty? Okay, uh, John, the way I will uh, relay the key concepts in the World Bank report, I'll try to explain it also the way many of the Filipinos would be able to appreciate it better. Mm -hmm. So by learning poverty, simply put, these are the students by age 10 who are unable or have difficulty reading and understanding even the simplest texts. Mm -hmm. So this is... Uh, what we call from our team's end, edukahirapan, hirap o hindi makapagbasa ang bata. And the way the World Bank calculated learning poverty is a combination of two other factors. Mm -hmm. The first is called schooling deprivation, which means the percentage or the share of students not able to access schooling or the education mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. The assumption being, if they are unable to come to school, they are likely not able to read or will have difficulty and will consequently have difficulty reading. Mm -hmm. So in Filipino, we call this, hindi pumapasok, hindi or hirap magbasa. Okay. Then the other side of it is learning deprivation, mm -hmm. which is accounting for the share of students in school or in education, formal education settings, yet they do not reach the minimum proficiency levels in terms of reading. So, sila yung pumapasok o nasa paaralan, pero hirap magbasa. In the case of the Philippines, we are low in both schooling deprivation, or we have a high, rather, sorry, schooling deprivation uh, uh, rating, and a very high learning deprivation incidence as well. So what does this mean? Eventually, if we are unable to address both schooling deprivation and learning deprivation, mm -hmm. we will eventually move towards the direction of what the World Bank said as a higher incidence of the learning poverty gap, which means we're so far away from the expected uh, proficiency levels stipulated in the Sustainable Development Goals insofar as education indicators are concerned, 
And then there's the severity of learning poverty, which means there will be high inequity between and among the students who are already suffering from learning poverty. So Ed, in a nutshell, that's uh, what the World Bank is telling us. Yeah, Doc Ed, I really like, gusto, gusto ko yung concept mo na, or yung term na edukahirapa, no? as a way to translate uh, this concept of learning poverty. Uh, Miss Lau, mm-hmm. uh, in, in PBED, you've been tracking uh, the progress or the lack of progress uh, in the educational system. There are other ways to uh, uh, define what's, what's wrong with the educational system. This concept of learning poverty, what does it, what does it add to the discussion? Uh, what new way of looking at things does it bring to the table? So, yeah, as you think, thanks, John. As you said, you know, when us in PBED, we've been tracking this and even mm-hmm. before the pandemic, which I think the um, the latest report actually highlighted, uh, we were already experiencing a learning crisis. I think as early as 2016, um, we did a state of the of, of Philippine education um, press conference in, in mm-hmm. PBED. And our thesis was simple. It was um, kids are going to school but are not learning. Um, mm-hmm. And so learning poverty, this concept of learning poverty, what it adds to the discussion is, yes, it is that many kids are going to school, but they're not learning. But the, I think what's important and is, is this concept of poverty, right? Um, the, because when, when you already bring in poverty and this concept of poverty, it, it um, connotes in, inability to, to progress. Um, and because sometimes when you think about learning, it's like, ah, okay, it's very um, conceptual, mm-hmm. what does that actually mean? But then when you add the word poverty, it already um, uh, presupposes that there is a hindrance for people to progress. And so I think um, what's, what's important in this discussion is, okay, now government should have the political will to make sure that people overcome this learning poverty so that um, a, con- a country is prosperous. But I think more importantly, an individual is able to actually achieve his or her potentials and, and help his or her family. Um, so I think that's the that's the main importance there by adding um, the, the addition of the word poverty. Yeah, and I think that by uh, putting these terms, uh, these two terms together, learning and poverty, I think uh, World Bank and its uh, five other affiliates uh, or affiliate organizations uh, were able to you know, jumpstart the discussion uh, on mm-hmm. the education crisis, uh, not just in the Philippines, but in other parts of the world. You know? Uh, maganda talaga yung term na ginagamit mo, Doc Ed, ano? yung edu kahirapan. So, uh, talagang naka, nakabaon tayo sa kahirapan. Uh, even when it comes to learning. Ang, ang pagkaintindi ko, uh, Doc Ed, no? just to add to your definition, uh, pinili ng World Bank just one indicator. No? This is the ability of a 10-year-old to read simple texts. No? Uh, walang, wala, wala dito about writing, wala dito about uh, numeracy. It's just this Mm-mm. one. But I think Mm-mm. their idea was, this is a leading indicator. Kung hirap na sila just to be able to read a simple text at the age of 10, everything else, may hirapan sila. Correct. So parang it's, it's, it's really like a leading indicator. It's an element, what is the... What is the term? Uh, it's the, uh, the canary in the coal mine. Ano yung parang, <laughs> ito na, ito na, may, may problema talaga doon ano, sa, mm-hmm. sa baba. No? Uh, yeah. So it's, it really simplifies the problems in education uh, into mm-hmm. that one leading indicator. Tama po ba yun? Yeah, that, that's very much uh, correct, uh, John. No? And to make it, um, um, to, to make it um, more... Uh, specific, no? This is how it goes. If you provide a very simple informational text, it's not even literary in nature or opinion text or whatsoever, which are conceptually dense at times. So a simple informative text. You ask the 10-year-old, and then the first set of questions you ask would be would that you'd be asking are things that are literally stated in the material. Mm-hmm. They can't answer that. For example, mm-hmm. 
uh, who said this? They can't even recall immediately. And that's mm -hmm. uh, all just literal. Now, when you ask a question that is inferential in nature, which means you have to string together information found in the string of sentences you put together to answer that, for example, a why question, all the more they cannot give an answer. The worst part of it, if you go to the applied level of questions, which means, mm -hmm. so where do you use that information? What can you do with that information? Lalong bokya. So at three levels of comprehension, literal, inferential, and applied, our kids cannot understand. That's bad because those three layers you bring to several other learning areas. Right. Those are skills that you need to use access texts in mathematics, in social studies, in history materials, in science, and so on and so forth. So you can only imagine, mga ngamote ka talaga. You will find it difficult to go through assessments that are so much dependent on your ability to access and manipulate uh, information found in a text. That's right. Uh, Miss Love, so it turns out that we have a learning poverty rate of 90%, a little over 90%. 90% uh, of our 10-year-olds don't know how to read simple text. Are you surprised uh, by the number? Uh, what, what does this mean? This is one of the highest in the world, the second highest in ASEAN, next only to the uh, same level as Cambodia and next only to uh, Laos. Mm -mm. Um, I mean, it, it's just staggering, no? 90% learning poor. Your thoughts, Ms. Love? Um, not surprised, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, for, for many reasons. Number one, um, our learning levels were already very poor pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we were, our, our base, I think, learning poverty was at 70, between seven, if I remember the figures correctly, 70, 70 percent. Um, and so then the pandemic happened. The, when the pandemic happened in PBED, we, we understand that there was really, you know, like concern about public health and we had to keep our schools closed, but we were not able to actually effectively deliver remote learning. And so mm -hmm. um, already a low base, or a, in this case, high number of learning poverty. Um, mm -hmm. Couple that with inefficient remote learning um, delivery during the pandemic and the longest school closures in the world. I, we were not very surprised that you know the the number reached uh, this 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 level, um, ninety percent. Um, also because I think uh, unlike in many countries, education was really put in the back burner um, during the pandemic in the Philippines. Um, in in France, for example, where I am now. Um, during at the height of the pandemic, the public discourse was about how do we protect our old people, but also how do we prioritize the learning of our children? That rhetoric never really happened in the Philippines. And so, you know, all that, um, all the, the pandemic response, or in, in this case, lack thereof, um, already high learning poverty rates before, before the pandemic could only really lead to this 90%. Yeah, just to drive home the contrast, uh, I, I just look, looked it up. In France, the learning poverty rate is 6.9%, uh, you know, in contrast with our 90 point something percent, 90 point... Uh, 90 point uh, 9. 9. 9. 9 percent learning mm -hmm. poverty. Doc Ed, Miss Love, uh, my understanding is that the numbers for the Philippines and five other ASEAN countries uh, come from a February 2019 survey or assessment, no? the Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics. Metrics. So this was conducted in Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar in February 2019. All right? And yeah. already, I mean, uh, uh, the data for, for the 2022 report comes from that February 2019 assessment. Mm -mm. Uh, the results were released uh, in December 2020. I had not heard about this, so maybe that's a function of the fact that you know this is not my field. Uh, 
but uh, also I think that uh, compared to the rollout of the news from the World Bank, learning poverty, yung lumabas dun sa, SE, uh, sa CPML, uh, konti lang yung balita talaga. No? Um, my point is that um, the World Bank and the five other organizations said that pre-pandemic, the average learning poverty rate in the world was 57%. Now, through a, a series of simulations, they uh, say, they assert that the average today, or as of June uh, 2022, was now 70%, from 57 to 70. But you can already see that the Philippines 90.9% is way above even the new uh, average. But here's my point. This average of the Philippines, this uh, number of the Philippines, 90.9, is from February 19. There are no additional simulations for the Philippines and the five other countries. In other words, 90.9% learning poverty rate is the rate in February 2019. It could have only gotten worse. Do you agree? In the last two years. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, John. I think uh, among uh, educators studying the trends, um, there was really a massive failure in terms of our response towards uh, ensuring that the quality dimension of education is attended to, let alone access and continuity during the pandemic. So really, the, the school lockdowns exacerbated the conditions that we already experienced in 2019. And uh, if we refer to the other uh, corroborating evidence presented in the uh, study in May 2022 of the Philippine Institute of Development uh, Studies, or PIDS, mm -hmm. you'll find out that what exacerbated the condition was the fact that the modalities uh, that we have implemented during the pandemic, particularly in the public sec school sector, heavily were printed resources, which were just provided to the students. And most of them did not get enough scaffolding or responsive teaching that could have uh, in some way helped out the learners uh, adapt and probably thrive in the given uh, situation, which uh, if you compare to their peers in the private schools, they use modalities that are blended, introduce technology, also had some printed resources, but these uh, private schools were so adept in terms of uh, responding to any question, uh, any discomfort, any frustration that uh, their learners are experiencing, including the parents. And you know, and the amount of training that they invested in their mm -hmm. teachers, their parents, and their students to use their, these modalities, very high. But uh, of course, that shows you the kind of resource environment that we are operating between the public and the private school sector. But uh, the point here is that because resources weren't ready, the capabilities of our teachers were also not that high compared to the other nations who are you know, aware of the use of alternative delivery modalities during crisis situations. We were really, uh, you know, uh, caught very much unprepared to mm -hmm. face the situation. And the mere fact that we constantly delayed reopening the school systems, mm -hmm. um, and Love knows this because we were talking to policymakers at the time, start reopening mm -hmm. because the, the, the longer these pupils and students are from school, mm -hmm. the more that they will suffer a lot of learning loss. So yeah, that's a uh, that's the kind of exacerbated condition that uh, we had to endure and our learners had to endure. Let's return to this idea of uh, uh, exacerbation, you know? uh, lalo lang siyang lumala during the pandemic. But I want to go back to, uh, well, I, I, I found out that the results were actually released in December, the CPML results were released December 2020. Miss Love, uh, uh, not necessarily to, to the uh, Southeast Asia PML results, but other uh, other assessments. No, uh, there, there have been several in the last several uh, years. Um, how would you, how how would number one how how did the Department of Education respond to this, and how did the private sector 
part of uh, uh, the educational system also respond to this? Uh, can you give us a, you know, an overview? Uh, so first, we don't have a good culture of assessments and actually um, data in the Philippines. Um, we, while we do run annually the National Achievement Test, um, it's very difficult to actually get a hold of the results of the of the NAT. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of I don't know why top secret, kept top secret, <laughs> um, or, or or released like two years later. Um, and mm -hmm. in which case, you know, it's very hard to already come up with adaptive policies to really address what we what we can see in the NAT. Um, domestically, that's what we're kind of like confronted with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, at the, in, at the international level and international assessments, um, it's already good that we participated in the, the PISA, the TIMS, um, and then the CPLM. That, that's the most recent exam that uh, was used in the simulations. No? Um, but there was always this kind of fear that if we didn't do well in these exams, we might not join again. So... Um, because that had already happened, right, in the early 2000s, where in, in I think 2003 was the last time we, we participated in the teams, and then we didn't mm -hmm. do so well, um, and then we just did not participate for, for like, almost 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, amongst, like, education researchers, we were already kind of grappling with this culture of, like, um, fear of data or, like, data that, you know, could be implicating, mm -hmm. and so we, we don't even no ignorance is bliss um and then with when when the cplm came out it was the third of three international learning um, assessments mm -hmm. that um that came out uh i guess there wasn't that much media uh, pickup because it was already like oh okay tell me tell us something that we don't know, don't know. because yeah. pisa we were already last um, teams, we were also last in the rankings. And even in terms of, you know, the magnitude of that last place, um, in the PISA, 81% of our 15-year-olds could not meet the minimum global competency in reading. So, and in TIMS, it's it was even worse. And then CPLM, we weren't last, but we were in the middle. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were only ahead of, Mal of Myanmar and Cambodia, which I am not sure we can be super proud of. So um, in a way, it wasn't picked up because the we at least we weren't last. Um, but but it was still very, um, very worry, worrying because it also said that many of our fifth graders, so about 10 years old, um, could not uh, read, write, um, and also can do barely do math. Um, and was at what and as what uh, Ed was saying, these three min uh, competencies are your mm -hmm. your foundations basically, and it will then lead you to like do better as you progress uh, grade wise in 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 schooling. Um, go the government's response, um, if if I may be so blunt, um, it was to kind of diffuse the system, uh, the, the 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 bad news. Um, mm -hmm. When it should have been more of like, hey, this is troubling. We all know it's it's you know it's a problem. It's not one's person's fault or one's ad one admin's fault. We need to work together and do something. Uh, we think it was a missed opportunity politically because you know it was in in other countries like Peru, for example, when they placed last in the PISA, they used that as a political window to push for education reforms. We didn't do that. Instead, we were you know busy trying to kind of make the bad news not so bad. Um, mm -hmm. on, the, on the part of the private sector, to be fair, we, it's, it's also not the private sector's responsibility, right? But we could really see that there was um, a lot of, of um, will and, and, and expressions of, of support to help the, the public, public sector. Um, at some at some points, there was kind of like some opposition because we in the private sector were very very noisy about hey let's reopen our schools, um, mm -hmm. and you know to no avail. But 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 yeah, I think um, instead of 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 this particular piece of news being a policy window that we could all maximize, it was instead kind of like a PR game and and 
at, at the end of the day, the main victims aren't, you know, the public or the private sectors. It's really mm -hmm. our children, right? Yeah, that's that's oh, that's just terrible. Um, Doc Ed, uh, it turns out that the reading component of CPLM, which is the basis for the World Bank update, uh, was in English. Ah, I'm sorry, the entire assessment was in English, even though you know the 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 section in math, uh, you know the, the one on writing, but in English they were presented English text. No, they were presented English. Uh, uh, problems. Uh, question: Would, in your uh, view, would this have affected? Did this affect uh, the performance of our students um, because it was in English? Um, and should we, when we, when we do the CPLM again, assuming we don't, you know, opt, opt out, uh, uh, insist? like the five other countries, to, to do it in our own mother tongue. Mm -mm. No, John, I'm a, I'm a language education specialist. So yeah, no, no. <laughs> for the longest time, we have been pushing for mother tongue-based multilingual education in the primary mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. particularly the K-3 to uh, uh, stage, no? because this is where you strengthen uh, fundamental literacy. Mm -hmm. And what we know uh, from research and from evidence in the field uh, spanning several countries, jurisdictions, you will find out that the heavy emphasis on the child's language, which we refer to as the mother tongue. Remember, mm -hmm. the UNESCO refers to the mother tongue as mm -hmm. the child's language, the language by which the child feels, mm -hmm. I can learn more, I can uh, think better and I can use to uh, establish connections with my peers, with my teachers and my other community members. That's why we see that the mother tongue is the stronger language that propels the learner to gain that confidence to age in formal education setting. So if you use that because they're comfortable with it, they are likely to gain better command of the learning environment. Now, if you say to, let's say, a first grader that uh, from now on, you will stop using kankana A, and instead you use English immediately, there's deprivation happening there. Because mm -hmm. the language of consciousness, the language of competence and confidence of the child is kankana A. So if we do not capitalize on that, we will alienate the students. And I think that's what we have observed over the years. We have been trying to resolve this whole language issue in education. So John, to the long and short of my response to you, no, we should have also uh, taken that uh, model of, let's see if our students can really understand the concepts also in the mother tongue. But I know what the other camps would say, but we never teach these concepts in the mother tongue. It's heavily mm -hmm. in English. See, that's the whole point of it. We have not been listening to evidence coming from the ground and from all <laughs> um, uh, longitudinal research on the role of the mother tongue in early literacy. So mm -hmm. there is a policy in place on mother tongue-based multilingual education in the DEPED, but to the point of love earlier, the way it begins is rather uh, faulty because a lot of language profiling contingent on the assessment of language competencies needed, needs to be done. You cannot just assume that, okay, there's a lingua franca spoken in this region, that becomes the mother tongue that you will use from kindergarten all the way to third grade because that's the mm -hmm. progression model. And you know, from there alone, you will find out that, uh, oh, we missed on the point that in the classroom, there are not too many speakers of Ilocano, but instead, their mother tongue really from the very beginning was English. And let me tell you, English is a mother tongue. <laughs> mm -hmm. If the child really grew up with it from the very mm -hmm. start, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you turn to Ilocano and in, impose that, there's already a disconnect. And there's going to be a lot of battle in terms of the readiness and confidence of the students. So, yeah, we, 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 we should have at least tried mm -hmm. or be open to the idea because English is our second language. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, it remains as a second language in the Philippines. Miss mm-hmm. Love, uh, based on your knowledge of, uh, oh, did, based on your knowledge of uh, education politics, <laughs> um, I know that uh, the problem, you know, the the, the the issue of mother tongue uh, teaching is uh, complicated. But what are the chances that in the next CPLN and maybe similar assessments, we can actually have the tests conducted in the mother tongue or, or in mother tongues? Mm, it. Well, actually, it is part. It is when you when you um, when a country signs up um, for these um, international large scale assessments, um, they can choose the language. And mm-hmm. so, well, there's just guidance that it has to be the la- the medium of instruction, and that's why for these three um, ex- uh, tests we chose English because mm-hmm. technically, on paper, um, our medium of instruction for these grade levels. Uh, is already English, and so we chose that. But um, there's nothing preventing us from from actually saying to these um, organizations, no, to that the the exam will be taken mm-hmm. in the mother tongue or say Filipino. I just would caution though that to and especially and I completely agree with Ed's point earlier. We don't teach math concepts in Filipino. Mm-hmm. We don't teach science concepts in in Filipino, and so. Even if we were to take the exam in Filipino for math and science, I'm not sure we're gonna do super well. Um, for for reading, maybe a bit better, um, but it's it's I, I'm not so sure. So there's nothing stopping us. I guess the short answer to your question, John, politically, there's not nothing stopping us from from uh, taking the exam in Filipino. But I'm not so sure if we're gonna do any better, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for your candor. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we, I, I wasn't really planning to spend uh, a lot of time uh, talking about what can be done. I, I would like to return to this issue uh, more than once, no? because I think it's a it's a very complicated and a very consequential issue. But uh, Ms. Love, I just want to uh, go back to your point about regular assessment. Uh, you know that we don't we don't have a culture of assessment, and in fact, and yet, uh, the World Bank and its affiliate and the organizations that were part of this uh, report uh, recommend what they call the rapid approach, and the A there stands for regular assessments. No, Totoo nga naman. Mm-hmm. If you if you do teach, you know that the best way to to uh, to make sure people, your students are learning is regular, uh, frequent assessments. You know, different kinds of assessments, but regular and frequent. Um, do you think that's in the realm of the possible? <laughs> Again, it's a political uh, uh, question that uh, we can make common cause with you know main, many stakeholders in the in the in the sector and say no, let's let's have regular assessment, assessments. Let's pay for all these international assessments. Let's have let's do our own and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's in the realm of the possible? Oh, is it just? Yeah, that's for you, <laughs> Miss Lai. <laughs> but I will pitch uh, something in also. Oh, so sorry, ahead, I, I, my, the screen froze, so I didn't hear part of what your question was. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to go back to the to the point about regular assessment. So that's one of the uh, that, that's the point that you raised. That we have a, a right. fear of assessment. Uh, it becomes a PR game, and yet the World Bank and uh, other groups uh, suggest that that's one of the. Uh, uh, medium-term uh, ways of right. uh, coming out of this whole big hole. No? Uh, is that yeah. in, within the realm of the possible for the Philippines? Honestly, I so um, I think so. Um, one, because we can actually, I hope VP Sarah, now Education Secretary, um, mm-hmm. will actually use her political capital and her relatively lack of experience in the education sector to really be that champion for assessment, right? Mm-hmm. She doesn't have the baggage of being a former educator or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. She she actually, and I think she's curious enough and actually willing enough to really solve the, 
the problems of, of the education sector. And I think, you know, if, if there's something that I can advise her is, is to really like use assessments to come up with better policy decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and she has so much political to do, political capital to do it. Um, and so I think it is very, very possible. We also have to note that there are two types of assessment, right? Classroom level assessment, which mm -hmm. I think teachers naman do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also a system-wide assessment wherein, you know, like the national achievement test where you can really see what how the entire system is, is, is performing. Um, I think that um, from just the culture of assessment in general, I think we should um, incentivize teachers to, um, in a way, explain what assessments are for. It's mm -hmm. not to make uh, the child feel dumb because they failed an exam. It's more of like, okay, this is really, you know, like this is to, for us to diagnose what is what is wrong, where, where you're having a hard time um, or which areas you're having a hard time in. And therefore, this is the kind of support that you will need. On the, on the systemic level, it's very important because, um, you know, we always hear on the news like some so-and-so politician saying, oh, we should add this to the curriculum or that mm -hmm. to the curriculum, whatever. Um, but, you know, we can't, we can't just add or subtract or whatever without having a clear idea of where our system is. And so, um, yeah, I guess to short answer to your question, John, I think it is very possible given that um, VP Sarah is, you know, relatively new to the education space. She doesn't have that much baggage. Um, she can really, if she wants to learn from or listen to experts um, and evidence um, and then, yeah, like um, use her political capital. She has a lot of it anyway. To really mm -hmm. push for, for this kind of data culture that uh, we need. Thank you. Okay. Those are excellent points. Uh, Doc, Ed, you wanted to say something also about yeah. this? No, just a rejoinder, no? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, John, when the World Bank published the report last June, they mm -hmm. mentioned that the high estimates that we have right now are brought about by three factors. And mm -hmm. among those three factors, the first was of course, this is the first time that many regions in the world and many global agencies are starting to make sense of better measures and better mm -hmm. ways of, um, uh, you know, using data analytics. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of new technologies that are concerned with this. It's becoming more and more part of the consciousness of the expanding global ecosystem for education access and quality. So uh, it's natural that at the onset, we get a very glaring data, but in the case of the Philippines, it's glaring and enduring data. <laughs> or it's yes. getting worse, no? Mm -hmm. And our disposition there, and I will really be frank in saying this, is not to look at the data as, hmm, um, maybe that's not true or something like that. Because that's what happened when the first wave of the international reports came out. You know, mm -hmm. we brush it off and Right, uh, love is correct. We missed that opportunity to respond to the numbers. Remember, numbers don't lie, but more importantly, they tell stories, and that's why we are asking our state education agencies you have tremendous amount of data, make sense of the data, and make sure that you find the narratives that make the data so um, comprehensible and so concrete that even our classroom teachers and even our parents would know what to do because you cannot constantly arrive at a very good program okay um, and sometimes with fancy names yet you do not anchor it on data there's a huge bureau of educational assessment in DepEd, for example mm -hmm. but how much of the work of Bea do we know how much has been released to the public how much of that are we consuming and translating into good practices and policies? Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot be doing a lot of policies not driven by data. That's so dangerous. Thank you. Doc Ed, uh, 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 we, we've spent the last 39 minutes or so uh, essentially just clearing the ground. No? Uh, we wanted to really uh, define the problem. Uh, which leads me to the main question that I've been meaning to ask. What are the causes of our learning poverty? You pointed to the pandemic as an accelerant. No? I mean, it, it worsened yeah. things, right? Uh, and, and, and you were both very clear about why. But 
the data from CPLM was as of February 2019, before the pandemic. And as Ms. Love pointed out, that's not the first time. Uh, and as uh, the, uh, the president of PBED said uh, in another interview, uh, the data has just been consistent. It's been like that. No, we, We've been seeing the same, uh, the same trend. So I, what I want to ask uh, really is, uh, what are the main causes? So I'd like to ask the two of you. Dr. Ed first and then Ms. Love. What are the main causes of our learning poverty? Um, so many dimensions to uh, pick. Uh, but Lava, maybe I'll begin with, um, you know, continuing that discussion. Why mm -hmm. are we unable to capture data that can help our learners? Mm -hmm. The primary data gatherer and the one who should be analyzing the state of learning conditions at the level of the classroom or the entire school, of course, should be teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's why if VP Sara Duterte, our education secretary, will really be true to what she said, to lessen, the ad lessen or remove the administrative functions of teachers so that teachers can just concentrate on assessing mm -hmm. uh, and delivering um, learning, I think that will be uh, a good um, uh, way to jumpstart the system and make sure that teachers really spend more time looking at how our learners are learning, how they are coping with the difficulties um, uh, hounding their engagement in the learning process. I'll start with that. Um, in so far as the teachers. Thing, Ed, is that one cause is that uh, unfortunately. Our teachers are overworked. They're overworked. <laughs> That's and they're not always teaching. I mean, they can't yeah. concentrate on teaching. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you imagine in, in a day's time, if you ask a teacher, and I'm teaching uh, graduate school students who are coming from deaf ed, when mm -hmm. I ask them, how much time do you spend on assessing students, uh, they will always tell me, Sir, nauubo siya sa sangkatutak na papel. <laughs> so, what do you mean? We have a lot of forms to use mm -hmm. to accomplish. You know, if you can automate that, so to relieve the teachers of that function and to just uh, instead look at the numbers, how, how students mm -hmm. are faring in their assessments or how much one student is accomplishing in terms of the intended learning outcomes of the curriculum, that's going to be a tremendous help to helping every learner meet the expectations of the curriculum. I'll begin with that. And um, maybe uh, Love would like to add something or uh, pitch in a different idea. Yes, with Love. Yeah, um, definitely teacher quality is, is a problem. So um, what Ed mentioned, I, I agree with um, that, you know, teachers are busy doing administrative things, basically non-teaching roles that they shouldn't really be bothered with because they should be focused on on, on the learning of their students. Um, but there is actually this elephant in the room, right? That I think uh, we don't talk about a lot. Like, and I, I I empathize so much with teachers because they have so much work, but many of them are also not really qualified to teach the subjects that they're supposed to teach. Um, there was a the 2016 study um, that was conducted by PNU and um, and uh, funded by, by by the Australian government and also the World Bank, wherein they looked at the the competencies of teachers. Uh, so basically, they asked the teachers mm -hmm. um, ten questions in the subject that they're teaching, and only about and and on average. Um, they could only answer four out of ten correctly in the subject mm -hmm. that they're supposed to teach, and mm -hmm. so it's it's quite difficult. I mean, you can you can argue, right? That um, how can you teach something you you yourself don't know? So there is also that problem of teacher quality and how um, and how, for example, like um, it's it's kind of like a a. It's a lifetime job, right? Um, I think mm -hmm. VP Sarah also mentioned this that many, many teachers like I mean, many people want to go into teaching because you can't be fired once you become a teacher, regardless of your performance. And so, um, it's 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 very important also for us to kind of look at the profession of teaching. How do we make sure that those who are already teaching are able to be given I don't know like professional development so that they are competent in the subjects that they are teaching? Um, how do they progress so that they don't remain stuck in um, you know like teacher one position? I think if you look at the the 
the the makeup now of of teachers in in the department of education uh, more than majority are still at the teacher one level meaning they're not progressing career wise so it's also important to look at that um but other than teaching, which is actually, we can devote actually John, like an entire episode just on teacher quality. But mm -hmm. um, I wanted to kind of um, add another point as to the reasons why we're learning poor. Um, the, 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 the first one is, um, I think we don't, we see education almost like as a kind of just a step right we don't see it as a whole and how you're actually building on a person's life and you're investing in a person's life all throughout his or her mm -hmm. lifetime and so we there's a disconnect when when we have a one first 100 days policy for the mother and the young child after that they get past the child then gets passed on to i think dswd and then from dswd it gets passed on to to dep ed but it's super important to make sure that the first let's say five ten years of a child's life is really well supported they are nourished mm -hmm. they they are they they're eating properly they they don't mm -hmm. go to school hungry so that they're able to retain so this this um what's the term like um disconnected idea of human capital development is something mm -hmm. that i think is a main reason why we're learning poor the other one and this is more i guess more specific to education is are, are, are it's like learning inputs are also not very good um so text textbooks are are not very good um and now even though we now have the you know like the beauty of technology you have so much good content online that mm -hmm. are free but then um we we don't we don't have we also have that digital divide we don't make use of that um we still keep on manufacturing you know like these modules that don't really help in learning um so i think we also need to do something about the the learning inputs because um i think in the cplm study there was there was a data point there that showed that our kids were still sharing textbooks which should really not be the case it should be one is to one right but we were still mm -hmm. um sharing textbooks and now with technology um, I think we should may really consider making sure that, you know, we bridge that digital divide so that all of our children have access to high quality content that's already free online. Uh, Ms. Lau, there's so much to unpack just in your last answer, but I, I want to make a quick follow up uh, to the uh, point about the uh, problematic quality of uh, teachers. No? Uh, is this proof that, in fact, our problem with the education system uh, goes back decades that our own teachers are the very products of the problematic educational system. Perhaps when they were 10 years old, they also had difficulty. I mean, some of them had uh, similar difficulties. Is, mm -hmm. is that a fair way of uh, uh, assessing the system? Yes, um, actually, Ed probably has more to say about this than me because like he's, he's, he's studied, you know, the history of of, of teaching and teaching teacher quality in the Philippines but what we have seen yes it is it is that um uh from from my research I I you know I saw that um there was there was I think a policy in the 80s wherein like um universities basi basically lowered their admissions um standards for teacher education programs um but increased the 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 admission standards for all the others like engineering and math or whatever um but for teaching it it it, it was lowered because we needed more teachers and so we just needed to get more and more but the quality mm -hmm. kind of suffered but but um yeah as i said ed knows more about this than i do so i i well, leave the yeah, floor we... to him <laughs> i see the well, floor to him yeah, love, maybe uh, uh, the last word uh, from you, Doc Ed. Uh, we're running long. This is this is love a very pretty much engaging. Yeah, love discussion. pretty much captured it. Uh, that's uh, that's how it was. No, uh, there's a poor appreciation of the profession, that which translates to the motivation of teachers to do quality learning, and of course their preparation at uh, pre-service. We have a lot of issues there, and add to that plate all the issues on a very congested curriculum, like. Mm -hmm. uh, every change of leadership the curriculum gets more and more congested but the rest of our peers the rest of the world is moving towards a more simplistic yet uh, driven by essential learnings that will cut across a lot of uh, 
spheres of human experience no so it's a confluence of two many things there's the teacher there's of course the general disposition of the society about teaching and learning processes there's technology access and so on and so forth but let us not uh, uh, forget a more uh, essential issue here we have to look at how the education uh, system is programmed at the moment are our education agencies talking with one another there is deped managing basic education there is the commission on higher education there is the technical education skills and development authority and many other allied agencies that's another item that we have to zero in on john because love is correct if we actually put our acts together we can make better sense of what is happening in the system so this is only one part of the whole ecosystem we're talking about the poor performance or poverty in basic education but mm -hmm. remember john these basic education students will sooner or later be in our technical institutions or higher education institutions and god knows the extent or the quality that they will actually uh, be at or the quality levels eventually because we don't know if the foundation was really good or bad so that's why my last point, uh, John, we really have to seriously support the direction towards the second Congressional Commission on Education. It has lapsed into law and hopefully we can jumpstart the comprehensive review of the education system and find out the vantage point or the dimension of teaching, learning, the planning system, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of work to do. On that uh, forward-looking note, uh, we can end this very engaging discussion. Uh, we ran really long. Usually, my show just runs for about 35 minutes. But, uh, oh, no. uh, but this is really <laughs> a consequential issue, you know. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ed Fermin of the National Teachers College and Ms. Lovelane, Ms. Love uh, Basiliote of Philippine Business for Education. Thank you for your time, your insights, and your work that allows a higher level of discourse in the public square. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, love. This is a multidimensional, intergenerational problem. We will be sure to return to this issue as often as necessary. But that's it for us for now. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night.